Hello and welcome to this mini lecture on the history of Tantra in the most condensed form. My name is Cyan Pascal. I'm the founder of The Light Collective. We are an online yoga studio. We run yoga teacher trainings and we do our best to put out information, lectures on the wisdom of yoga as well as practices and techniques that you can utilize yourself. So if you're interested, please hit subscribe or head to our website if you want lots and lots of detailed information. Let's discuss now though a kind of condensed history of Tantra. So Tantra is an ancient system and it really started to flourish in about the 5th century CE. Before that it was probably being practiced. So the Vedic period of yoga, which ranges from about 10,000 years ago up until, um, you know, the start of the common era, so 2,000 years ago, was a very full yogic tradition with a lot of literature, a lot of philosophy. Practices were um, generally very meditative and there was a general viewpoint on um, a kind of ascetic practice, that is practices which were quite hard, arduous, and that were life-denying in some way. So it was difficult to be a yogi then uh, and have a life and have a job and have a partner or children. And things started to change at the start of the common era. So yogis were moving into the mountains, there were kind of communities being built, and the system of yoga began to change. So even though I say that the practice of tantric yoga you know, began around the 5th century, uh, really there could have been a lot of practice happening maybe for a couple of centuries or more before it was written down into doctrine. So we start to see books detailing practices and the philosophy of Tantra at about the 5th century. And if you want to know what those practices and philosophies were all about and what made them so special, you can watch our previous video on classical Tantric yoga and the classical tradition of yoga. And during this period, what we have is an explosion of Tantric yogis. It becomes the primary way to practice yoga, working with the breath and working with mantra and working with a kind of um, very inclusive philosophy, very um, life-affirming, uh, very, I suppose, goddess-centric very feminine in nature. Now, there are nine streams of Tantra that are happening throughout the course of these 700 years. In much the same way that somebody says, oh yeah, I'm Christian, you're kind of like, mm, what kind of Christian are you? Are you Catholic? Are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Are you Mormon? Are you Protestant? There's all these different streams that are coming from the one uh, Judo-Christian base in the same way, Tantra had a kind of base to it and many different lineages. So in this period, all of these lineages come up and all of these books are written and they become more detailed and more focused and thousands and thousands of Tantras, these are the doctrines of the Tantric lineage, are written in this time. Everyone's practicing it. It has its stronghold in the northern area of India today, so the northern part of the Indus Valley, which is known as Kashmir, which is a really incredibly beautiful place to go to if you can. Um, it's a disputed territory now. So when oh, – why did I get into this? The British – divided India up into Bengal, India and Pakistan. They divided parts of the country up and Kashmir became kind of half in Pakistan, half in India and both countries are trying to claim it as their own, which in some ways this modern part of history is important because this is where the stronghold of Tantra was in Kashmir. And then at around the 12th century, the Islamic or Mughal invaders start to come into India. So when they come into India and everyone is like worshipping the goddess and doing all these goddess-centered practices and there's this very kind of like, <laughs> I guess you could say sex-positive view of the cosmos and then the Islamic kind of 
And again, the Islamic tradition comes from a kind of, like it's a Islamic Christian Judeo tradition, which is not in any way supportive of the goddess. They start to destroy the texts, the temples, they destroy the monasteries, and the practices are no longer allowed. So these pundit, or kind of like the families of the kind of tantric priests and gurus and teachers, they have to go totally underground with the practices. And for the most part, it's said that about 75% of the tradition is lost, which we'll never get back. It was destroyed. It's gone forever. But there are a few families, a few Kashmiri pundit families that kept and held the doctrines, the tantras and the agamas within the families. And if you've ever been to India, you'll know there's like bugs and there's mold and there's wet and monsoon season. And so for the people who held these texts, and they weren't just in the Kashmir, but they were mostly there, they were all across India. For some of the people who kept the texts over 900 years. Some of them were just destroyed because somebody left them in an attic or there was a fire or because they moved house and they didn't know what it was or weather kind of molded the entire tantra. And so, so much of this wisdom was lost and they weren't allowed to practice it in public. So some practices were kind of kept underground. Some people kept practicing them. But we're talking 900 years here. It's very hard to keep any kind of spiritual tradition alive for 900 years. There is a brief period in this 900 years, which I don't know a lot about. And for political reasons, the during the British Raj, which is the period where the British colonized and ruled India, there was a time when, for political reasons, the British Raj put in a kind of tantric supportive ruler into the Kashmir. And during this period, a lot of the tantric um, texts were salvaged, but this didn't last for very long. And, you know, of course as well, the British Raj were not always supportive of traditional practices and there was a lot of missionaries moving through. So for 900 years, there is a sense that this entire practice went underground. The tradition, the oral tradition of teaching the practices was lost and many of the doctrines were lost. And the thing about the tantric doctrines is that a lot of what's written is codified. So it, it isn't like a normal today yoga manual where you breathe in for the count of three, hold for the count of three, exhale for the count of three. It wasn't written in those terms. The whole body was described within the tantric texts as being a reflection of the cosmos. So when you were breathing for a certain period of time into a certain part of your body, they were referencing the, the zodiac. So you breathe from cancer towards the sign of Aquarius. I'm not... Um, saying this accurately. I'm just using this as an, as an example. This is a very highly specific point in your body that you are moving your attention to in the subtle body. And so this was codified in a way that meant that the everyday person can't pick it up and understand it. So then what happens, we kind of cut forward to the year about it's around about 1900 and there are a couple of people who have a really big influence on the history of Tantra in the 20th and 21st centuries and the first person is this man who calls himself Arthur Avalon but his real name is Sir John Woodruff. He happens to get his hands upon a late Hatha yoga text called the Shat Chakra Nirupana. And this is the, the practices of the, the chakras in the body. What he doesn't realize, he's a Sanskrit scholar. He's very good. I'm not here to say that he's, you know, in some ways been, um, you know, I don't know Sanskrit. So this guy obviously knows Sanskrit much better than me. But what, what happens is he gets a hold of this text uh, he doesn't realize that it's not actually a traditional tantric text. It's more of a kind of uh, 
a commentary or a kind of it's it's kind of like the notes from the late Hatha tradition. So it's a much later text. I think it's around 15th century text. And when he starts to um, translate this text, because he doesn't have other similar texts around, he can't use other texts to compare the language to and so he gets some of the languaging wrong specifically around the chakras around the mantras the way they're perceived within the tantric tradition and on top of that the book the shat chakra nirupana itself isn't even the totality of the tradition so it's really a kind of like a summary of an older book that's probably been lost so they're kind of summarising what they know or what's been handed down. He then creates a book known as The Serpent Power, The Secrets and the Secrets of Tantric and Shaktic Yoga. And in it he goes into a lot of detail with the chakras and the tantric energy body. And he unfortunately gets a bunch of things wrong. And because this, like a lot of it he gets right – and because it's totally revolutionary, it's mind-blowing to people in the 1900s when you think that they're coming, coming from a really kind of oh, Christian sort of, think about America in about 1900, super Christian, very um, suppressed ideas around sexuality. There's no energy body. Uh, it's revolutionary and people are so excited about it. And there are incredibly influential people who pick up this book and read it, including the psychiatrist Carl Jung. Now, he is a brilliant man. And what he says when he um, reads this book, he gives a series of lectures and he says, I don't know everything, okay? What I'm going to talk about is a way that the Westerner can understand this tradition. And I don't even believe Westerners should be following this path because we're never going to be able to have the depth of understanding that people in India are going to have. Now, people reading this text in the following decades, so this is printed um, – in like the 1930s, but it's been disseminated before them through lecture notes and it's kind of utilised by other authors like um, Joseph Campbell and then through him, Anadia Judith, and these people who um, kind of take all of this information which is innovated upon and also inaccurate, and this becomes the Western understanding of the tantric energy body, the chakras, and what we understand from tantric philosophy. Now, because there has always been a cross-cultural influence going on between India and the West – for the last 300 years, it's really hard for us to say there is one traditional Indian yogic practice because even in India, this information was lost. So in India, they don't have the traditional practices still there to draw upon or the texts or the people who have the knowledge to be able to decipher these texts and so there is this kind of back and forth of information where you find that even in India, you're being taught inaccurate tantric ideas. It happens in India and it happens in the West because there is always this kind of flow of information. Now, to kind of talk, talk about what's going on in terms of sexuality and tantra in the West, there is a guy called Pierre Bernard. And he, he's, I think he's actually American, although his name sounds French. He discovers also in the early 1900s some tantric texts. And what he finds is this very kind of, again, I'm using modern language, sex positive language within the spiritual text. And it's describing uh, lovemaking meditations and unions between the god and the goddess. And they're within one of the streams, within, within one of the tantric yoga streams, there is an, it's a very sexy viewpoint of the cosmos and the world. There is this idea that the cosmos is a kind of 
pulsing, pleasure-filled union between Shiva and Shakti. And Pierre Bernard pounces on this. And he has like such little information to draw upon, but he kind of says, yes, I'm, a, I'm an expert, and he creates schools and practices, and he does a lot of innovating. And because Westerners are so suppressed sexually, they're so excited to see sexual practices to kind of validate their own kinkiness, they jump on Tantra as being this path forward as a kind of spiritual sexuality. And none of this was really detailed within any of the tantric texts themselves. So what has happened in the last 120 or 30 years is that the tradition has been mistranslated, it's been innovated upon, and certain aspects of the tradition around sexuality have been kind of focused upon and again, innovated upon. And really, um, the idea of tantric yoga is one that's divided into classical tantra and now neo-tantra. And a neo-tantric practice is probably something that a lot of people are more familiar with. This is the kind of practice which involves sexology practice. It involves um, some traditional ideas. It involves sacred sexuality. And these are all really beautiful practices. So I'm not here saying that I am against all of it at all. I am here to say that they are incredible practices. They're just not traditional tantric practices but they are totally beautiful and I teach some of them because I've learned about them and I love practicing them and they've changed my life. So I'm not here to say that neo-tantra or sacred sexuality is not a good thing. I think it's really important for everyone, especially the women that I teach. What I do want to say is that the classical tantric tradition is hard to find, but we are living in this incredible period of time where these texts are being saved. And there are a few teachers, a lot of them based in the States. Uh, some of them come from Kashmiri Pandit families. Others are lecturers at top universities or um, Sanskrit scholars and practitioners. They are in the process of archiving thousands of tantric texts that have come through from Kashmiri families that have been um, held in... Kashmiri libraries, but have been mistranslated. So they're being redocumented now, and they are now being translated with this whole corpus of text so that um, there is a sense of comparison going on, a sense of accuracy that's coming out. And what we're finding is, and what I'm really excited about, is that I'm starting to learn practices that actually come from the manuals, the tantric manuals. And these are practices of breath, mantra, meditation, and the subtle energy body. So it's a very exciting time to be around because a lot of this work is now, just now, in the last like 10 years, in the last one year even, it's all happening in the world of Tantra. And there is this spread and flood of accurate information that's happening. And really we're at the start of the Tantric Renaissance where I think over the next few hundred years, more and more of this information is going to be available to people in more accurate ways. Thank you for listening to this condensed version of the history of Tantra. If you are wanting to go into greater depth, we have trainings like the Light Collective 200-hour uh, yoga teacher training where we describe all of this and the Light Collective Method is another advanced yoga teacher training. And if you're interested in more sacred sexuality practices, we have the Sacred Woman, which is a course for those who want to access the Divine Feminine. And if you don't want to sign up for any of that, just click subscribe below and you can get more of this free information and free practice online. Thank you.